thanks for the introduction. So I'm not going to talk about myself too much. A little bit of background of myself. Uh, I was born and raised in China. Um, and um, during high school years, I went to a fine art high school where I spent um, four hours every day on arts, another four hours for um, academic. So I was always um, uh, thought my career would be related to art, but I was also interested into design. And later on, I found out there's a difference between art and design. Art is if you have something nice, you can impress somebody, you know, you, you can do your self-expression and I think you are successful already. <clears throat> but industrial design is to design for everyone, to be able to improve people's life and experience. And that's really motivated me to be an industrial designer because I really want to um, create a better life for, for people. So this was me a um, long times ago at my first class in China. Um, my daughter pointed out when, <laughs> when she saw the photo, she said, oh, you look like a boy. So I was just like, you know, cutting my hair really short. I think that was cool. Um, but, you know, this was a photo that um, we took. It was my first industrial design class uh, when I was, uh, the class was like learning how to do a model, but also like, you know, entry, the first class to learn, you know, how to do design. So my design at that time was a wearable tech. Um, it was a communication tool. And I was imagining in the future, we don't need to limit it to device. We can really use technology by using simple gesture. You can communicate to each other. So at that time, I was really excited about my first design because I could really see the future through my work. So um, <clears throat> that's why I feel like designers are creators who are responsible to build a better future. And tonight, I would like to share some of our work examples to talk through what I think as responsibility of design and designers. <clears throat> a design that can really build a better future often comes from an idea, a vision. So to bring that vision to life, to solve the problems, hasn't been solved before, especially required design from the ground up. And it's much, much harder, but it's also much more fun. Snow is a product that was launched uh, in the beginning of 2017. That project actually took us five years from uh, concepting to final production. We collaborate with American pediatrician, Dr. Harvey Cobb. And maybe you guys are too young to know this, but lack of sleep is really, really common for uh, new parents. And it's an international health issue. So 50% of baby, based on study and research, 50% of babies are still awake and cry at night, even though they are fat, you know, they have clean diaper. And then 15% of mothers and 25% of spouse suffer from postpartum anxiety and depression. And this is like not just affecting your work, your family, relationship, people around you, and even the society. And also research shows that, you know, every year that's roughly 3,500 um, 3, or 4,000 um, infant death from the SIDS, right? Sudden infant death syndrome. So all these, all these issues are really, really related to lack of sleep. So Dr. Harvey Cobb, um, he dedicated his life to, to look into how to solve this problem. So in his book, the happiest baby, he introduced this five basics method to, for soothing baby. So he called it 5S, swaddle, size stomach, position, shush, swing, and suck. So all these like multi-scenario approach to really replicate the environment of the womb to help newborn to feel comfortable and help them to sleep better and longer. So he wrote a book, he hosts a lot of workshops, you know, teach parents, but every baby is different. So he came to us and with a vision to really try to create a product, can extend his method 
and import, most importantly, can really be personalized to each baby. And to do that, we think we need to really create a hardware with embedded sensors and motors, AI, machine learning, data collection that can really create personalized human interaction. And it also needs to be really comfortable and safe like a womb. <clears throat> And it sounds like we're making a robot, but we really don't think the design should be like a robot because no one would like to put their baby in a machine. And on the other hand, it should be an object that blends into the home environment and your regular life. So it's a baby bassinet. Our goal is really to create a piece of furniture that with all the technologies hidden and the interactions and experience should be really simple and natural and automated. And because of that, we worked really closely um, with scientists, engineers to really carefully, you know, to, to identify the components to the technology, the sensors and the motors, and really carefully place them and hide them uh, embedded into the design. And even make sure, you know, like there's no visible joints, visible screws, everything will be like integrated together. We want this to look like a beautiful piece of furniture. And we study a lot um, on the safety regulation. So that's really strict of safety regulation related to baby products. Like for example, the height of the bassinet, the dimension, um, you know, softness, the material that we're using. So work on this very closely with the guidance. Also look into unconventional materials such as 3D mesh to create um, this vertical wall and to help for both visibility and breathability. And also be able to hide the movement of the bed because you know, the bed needs to create the movement. <clears throat> and swaddle is one of the five S. Um, and swaddle, swaddle baby is actually not easy for newborn parents. Um, so we designed this swaddle really keep in mind that, you know, not just safety, comfort, but also how easy you can put the baby in and take the baby out. Also the details to consider safety. For example, if the baby is a smaller size baby, if they sleep and wiggle, uh, if they slide the face inside the swaddle, mm -hmm. inside the sleep sack, how can we prevent the material cover up the nose and the mouth, for example, using mesh in the front. So all these are considerations of the um, uh, design details. So the final product is a simple and elegant baby bassinet. It's also a beautiful piece of furniture that can sit mm -hmm. inside anyone's um, home environment. And all the components and sensors are hidden inside the base of the bassinet. And the sensors be able to detach the sound, the movement, and be able to react to be able to generate the interaction, the shake, and play the, the white noise to help baby sleep. And the sleep set is using soft material that is stretchable, be able to fit the growing baby. And for safety, the sleep set needs to be able to attach to the bassinet. So before activating the function, you need to attach the sleep set on the bassinet. And because of that, Snoo is the safest baby bed in the world. So I, I have a video to show how it works. So you can hear kind of the rain of this channel. And now the motion's gonna start. And every time I look at these videos, like this is so amazing to see how how 
imagine how hard you can put a baby to sleep, but like imagine how much easier by using SNU. So the bassinet can react to the cry and the movement generate the interaction. So there's no control basically for, uh, for this bassinet, but we still design this app. Uh, the purpose is to help collect the data, help parents to know better of their baby's sleep, like how many, uh, how many times of nap the baby has taken today, um, you know, how many times the baby woke up and total how many hours of sleep so that they can compare this uh, sleeping data with the growth chart uh, with the baby. So in result, SNU is the first in the world design that really solving the sleeping problem. And in the past four years, we have really received incredible results on how much SNU has improved the quality and provide absolute safety for families. So there, there are already like 75 hospitals are using SNU already and SNU is the first uh, evaluated, evaluated by FDA that proved that it has ability to reduce the uh, sudden infant death syndrome. And SNU is really a great example to show how we use design and technology to really bring a vision to life and that's why it took so long, um, you know, starting a start from scratch and all the way create this reliable, functional, and also a good looking piece of furniture. So design use technology to enhance human life. What we are doing is really to, to build a bridge between human and technology. And we are in the age that um, you know, we have seen technology has progressed so much in the past few years. And we're living in, you know, with a lot of sensors already, AI and robotics. Um, and a lot of people really have the concern about like, how is robot going to, um, you know, take over human world in the future? And would robot really threaten our identity? But the truth is, um, we should see technology is just a tool and designer are the one to decide how to use the tool to help us, to help us to solve the problems, help us to enhance human life and experience. So I want to talk about this project called Superflex. So Superflex is a Silicon Valley startup. Uh, the company has renamed themselves to Seismic. Uh, after we finish the project. So they came to us with a research to show that 38% of American over 65 has mobility related problem. So lack of mobility is affecting to their social life and their mental health. And, you know, they have difficulty to get out of bed, difficulty to even load the dishwasher or walk around and not to mention going on a hike. So how do we help them to bring back this mobility? The design is neither create a walking tool to make you look like you're disabled, nor a, an Iron Man suit to make you look like you're robots. Our approach is um, by using textile to create this power clothing that feels like a second layer of skin. And by integrate fiber muscles, motors, battery sensors to be able to add strength and mobility to human body and really to maximize the comfort and really create um, very low profile, invisible layers that you can wear underneath your regular clothing. So these fiber muscles um, overlays directly on top of uh, the human natural muscle so both on the front and the back of the thigh, but we also have um, um, the fiber muscle overlay in the back for body posture. So the layer of muscle is able to move with you because it's right on top of the, your natural muscle. So it feels very seamless, um, feels very natural. So it helps you to sit and stand and also with the right body posture, it helps you to boost ability from the age of 70 and back to the age of 25. And 
most importantly, it helps you to continue to exercise your own muscle. So not just helping you to move, but also continue to, you know, help you to exercise yourself. And it's a robust suit, right? Because we're using these motors, AI sensors, um, batteries, but it's really important to make it feel natural. And with that in mind, our design, you know, we really designed the user experience by how we can bring in the natural human gesture to the physical experience. So we don't want to create any physical switch and controls buttons on the suit. We want everything to be controlled by the user's own body gesture. For example, we found out it's natural to lean forward when you want to stand up. So when you want to stand up, you lean forward, the sensor will sense that, okay, now you want to stand up. And then by place your hands on your thigh, you confirm this, um, you know, this um, gesture, you know, and by understanding the confirmation from the user, the, 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 the motor, the battery will be able to pull the muscle, help you to stand up. So this entire experience is a natural human experience, but also by using human confirmation to avoid any mistake will happen. And we apply this experience principle to everything. For example, um, checking the battery level of the suit. You know, you can place your hand on the heart to feel the heartbeat of the suit. So our goal is really to deliver a very natural human experience so that you don't even notice or realize that you're using technology and have the technology really integrate with human life. And while we're refining the user experience, we are also evolving the, the apparel design, the hardware design. So what you have seen earlier, um, you know, this is the first prototype really to understanding the placement, the functional um, need for the suit. But the next step is to see how we can really hide them. So um, one of the challenge is really how we can um, um, embed these kind of hardwares and batteries and motors. So we have to, because you know, in order to power uh, this power clothing for four hours, four to six hours a day, we need to put a lot of battery. So battery placement, how we distribute the weight, or also work with the engineer together, really what define the form factors of the battery and which would affecting the final hardware design. Um, so we will work really closely with engineers together at this stage, but also doing a lot of mockups. And to think about how we can provide um, a way to hide this hardware, how you can you know, simply uh, attach the battery and detach the battery so that you can still wash this um, power clothing um, after wear. And because there's a fiber muscles, we also need to look into the textile design, the fabric structure, how we can integrate the fabric structure with the, you know, the fiber muscles. So, so it doesn't look like an you know, obvious piece of com components on top of the, the clothing, right? It's, it's really like everything's embedded, integrated. So we engage with 3D knit uh, vendors. So we wanna be able to knit this into one piece of garments. Um, the advantage of using 3D knit is you can knit the complex structure and lay in multiple layers in one piece, but also there's no waste because you, you only knit the area that, um, um, that is needed for this garment. So this is um, our visualization of using 3D knit how we can really design a pattern that flows um, along the body, not just integrate with the hardware, but also provide protections for the muscles and add the fa uh, flexibilities and performance uh, to the garment. And all the hardwares and, um, are hidden inside the pockets. Mm -hmm. And you know, all the, um, you know, the opening, the zippers are really hidden along with the, you know, the patterns of the knit structure. So that's, you know, that's the design 
exp an experience principle we created for um, this startup, um, Seismic. And since then, they have you know really um, continue with this experience principle and design philosophies to their product development. We hope to see their final products in the near future. And working in the design industry, I can always feel um, the growth of technology and also realize that industrial design has become more and more important in quickly bringing the new, new ideas to life and really help um, the company to, you know, to, to establish the vision and on how to use the technology. And Really, there are so many, so many opportunities these days because technology has grown so fast. Um, sensors are getting smaller; they're more accurate, you know, more accurate um, algorithms and machine learning. So, a lot we can do these days, and we're able to reach out to many areas that we couldn't before. For you know, different group of people, different ages, different countries, really help them to make their life easier, smarter healthier, and we're also able to pay more attention into healthcare and wellness category, especially for um, elders. So EDIQ is a project that we look into the lifestyle of uh, older adults. Research shows that um, older adults are more alone than ever before. 50% of women age 75 plus live alone as of 2013. So I think the number is increasing in the past few years. Depression, disconnect with social life are directly affecting to their health. But if we can really help them to keep um, actively engaged with others, with social life, it will really bring incredible positive health benefits to, to their life. So EDIQ is also a, a startup. Their challenge is really to help um, aging adults to stay connected to the world. We know that um, you know, when you're getting older, your cognitive functions are getting weaker and technology is also really complex and to a lot of um, uh, older generation, technology is also intimidating. And with the data showing, right, families and friends are not close by. So how can we use AI and robots, robotics, really to help them to maintain a healthy level of mental and social activity to reduce the feeling of um, loneliness? So our design mission is to create a social companion to keep older adults connected and engaged. And to do that, Decide a companion uh, first is really to think about how to develop a close relationship between human and machine. By working with psychologists, we learned that we, you know, we first really need to create a character for this robot because a character and a personality is the foundation to create relationship, to build a mutual communication. So we look into a wide range of characters that you know, can help build a companionship. So from a loyal pet, uh, a wise parrot, a curious child, or your, you know, your, your good friends or super butler, we learned that the best, um, the right character is really to mix these two. So a friend that's always uh, engaged, always be there with you, always want to help you when you are, you know, activating, um, you know, interacting with the robot. But we also would like to build a robot with the characters like a pet, like dogs. If you have dog, um, your dog will always notice you, and you see that you see your dog notice you by by their gesture. They don't need to bark at you to let you know that they notice you around. So, so we, we need to look into the active engagement and the um, inactive engagement and to combine these two different kind of characters together. And also work with the client to define the key product features. It needs to be a re really great uh, communication 
coordinator because it's going to bring your family, your friends with you. Also, it needs to be like really easy to talk to and really simple to operate because our users are the elders. And we don't, we envision that there's no way we can build a perfect robot because again, our audience is elder who has lived a long life with rich experience. We don't want a robot come in to show that they are the expert, they know more than the elder. We want the robot to be like um, a learner. So they're curious, they're in, in, engaging with the elders. They are interested to learn from the elder and understands you, you know, be able, be able to make the meaningful connections. And also safety uh, is also an important um, <clears throat> key product feature because when the older adults living by themselves, uh, how do we ensure the peace of mind uh, for their family and friends? So the form of the robot needs to really help people to understand the type of character. We, because of that, we look into two different kinds of architectures, one is composed, and we know that we need to have a screen. <clears throat> so the compose is basically separate the screen and the robots. And we have the Unite, which is putting the screen on, on the robots. So through the study and through the collaboration with um, the psychologist, we learned that Compose is the right approach because Compose allows us to contain and maintain the character of the robot would not be not mixed, you know, the, the audience, right? If you, from the screen, you see your daughter, but the daughter is on the robot's body, it potentially is it's gonna create confusion to, to mix up the two, dim, two different kinds of character or two, three, four different kinds of characters together. So by separating them, so have this unique um, identity and ownable um, consistent identity for, for this robot, really helps to contain the, the personality and build a companionship. And also rather than make it look like a real robot, we really decided to make it look like a simple tabletop object. So instead of create a realistic face, having the eyes, the mouth, we actually use a simple one circle light to express emotion. Um, also keep it, um, Keeping it abstract is also benefit uh, for uh, the users, for the older adults to imagine. So when they engage, they, um, they feel the character, the personality from the robot, they can also imagine to grow this uh, imagination in their mind. And also based on the study, uh, we know that the best placement is on the, uh, in the living room, on the side table next to the couch, we know that um, um, elder love to sit on the couch, um, um, especially when they can't move um, too much um, for their mobility uh, capability. So, so that's why we designed the object can sit nicely on the side table. And the display is removable so the elder can hold it in hand. They can also you know, walk around with the display to talk to their families, friends, they can also play games on the display. But you see, you know, like to, to bring these two elements together, we have this triangular tray on the bottom. So the robots always stage on this triangular tray. And when you put everything together, you know, th this tray is the platform to, to bring all the elements together. And to design for older adults, we also make sure um, there's enough grip on the tablet and there's an easy and an analog way to adjust volume. And there's also loud in, enough of speaker and sound. And the patterns is also the connection um, with the brand system that we designed um, to connect you know, from the physical to visual and even we use these elements on the app. And because the object is so simple, the robot is so simple, um, we also work on a series of um, a motion study to make sure you know, these simple elements can still create a wide range of body gesture and behaviors in combined with the 
the lighting for you know to express for communication. So I have a video to show you guys. Mary, Megan sent a new photo. Would you like to look at it? Yes, please. Oh, he's a gem. Would you like to respond to Megan's post? Sure. LEQ reminds me to take my meds, arranges rides for me. She even reminds me of all my appointments. Mary, don't forget bridge with the Golden Girls at 1 p.m. Would you like to practice? I don't need to practice. I didn't catch that. Do you want to play bridge or not? Oh, fine. Let's play. Mary, you wanted to Skype with Liz. Would you like to do that now? Oh, sure, that sounds great. Hey, honey. Hi, Mom. Hey, I just noticed, is it a little cool in the house? Oh, it feels great. I'm doing my Tai Chi now. Yeah, I can see. Okay, Mom. Just checking in. You take care. I'm fine, sweetie. Chat later. There's a new TED Talk waiting for you if you'd like to watch it. Or perhaps you could go for a walk. That's a good idea, LAQ. Great, Mary. I'll be right here when you get back. Great. Yeah, so LEQ has been in many elders' home for user testing, for improvement. And many of the feedback we have heard is um, um, after the user testing, they need to say bye to LEQ. They, they're like, oh, LEQ, we really don't want you to go because you know we can tell the elder has already built a relationship with the robots and really engage with um, the experience, the activities, um, the communication. So we're super pleased um, to the feedback and also look forward to see LEQ to be on the market um, in, the, in, the, in the next months to a year. Very soon it will be on the market. So AI and robotics can live in many, many forms, really depends on what kind of problem that we're solving. Ori is a robotic furniture that solves the living issue. Living space is getting more and more limited in big city um, like San Francisco, New York, Boston, I'm sure downtown LA as well. And micro housing has become much more popular really to provide a lower cost and functional living. So they're typically less than 350 square feet, and, but they're fully functional. So they have the kitchen and bathroom, but often people who live inside, they feel trapped because it's just so small. So we work with an um, uh, MIT startup called MoffLab to solve the problem on how to live in a small space, but without feeling and compromise the quality of your life. So it's a robotic system by using mini actuator, low power microcontroller with Wi-Fi connection, and also a brain, like a control for the movement. So we design a furniture that can move it can transform from a bed to um, uh, office and to living room, and you know can really create spacing, enlarge your spacing. And the designs really focus on a furniture look that can fit into many uh, small size um, apartments. And the bed is really the biggest uh, element to integrate into furniture. So we use a modular system. We look into the modular shelving on top and you know, based on the modular shelving dimension, we place two different sides of bed, uh, vertical and horizontal. And in combination of using um, bench or using a couch to be able to hide the bed. So we make sure we're not exposing any elements that doesn't look like a part of 
the furniture or anything that doesn't belong to the home environment. So by using this modular approach, we create different kinds of configurations. Like you have the TV cabinet, you have the couch, and you have um, closets, um, full closets and single, single closet. And there's a central control on the side of the furniture. This is the only tag you can see on this piece of furniture. And we're using forcing sensor, uh, force sensing. So you, when you touch the control, it will move the furniture. Um, it feels magical because you know you don't need to actually push for the push the furniture, but it's really just for safety. Uh, we want people to really touch the control, be able to move the furniture. But we also designed the app <clears throat> as um, um, extended user experience. For example, if uh, in the morning you're rushing to school to work, uh, you didn't clean up your bed, you can use the app to clean up your bed. Um, afternoon, you decided to go back um, to study at home. You can set your um, your, your your office ready. Um, in the evening, your friends coming over to party with you, you can get the living room ready. And at night, you come home late, you just want to sleep. So you just have the bed um, fold out for you. So here is how it works. <laughs> Alexa, can you ask Ori to make the bed? Okay. So for this, uh, we also, um, because it's a startup, we also help them create the name Ori. Um, when we're working on industrial design, we also have the brand designer to work along with us to design the, the brand. Um, so this is like Ori, is like origami, and also the folding of the, the logo is, you know, it's really related to the industrial design, how the bed, you know, how the bed can be unfold and how the furniture can transform into a different kind of functionality. And in 2019, Akia announced that um, Ori partnership to develop this robotic system. So soon, hopefully we can see this in, uh, in Akia. For now, they're working on B2B. So they work with the um, um, developer, um, really just build this uh, piece of furniture inside uh, the apartments. But in the future, you will be able to purchase that for yourself. So last thing I want to say, um, uh, sorry, the last case study I want to speak about is um, related to sustainability. So William Madonna, uh, he's a founder of Cradle to Cradle. Uh, he came to Fuse uh, one time many years ago. He did a presentation. Uh, one thing that struck me the most, he said, designers are the creators of good and bad. So we are designer, we are not just responsible for how the design look and works, but also how it soars and how it ends. And interesting uh, factor is 80% of the sustainable choice was made in the design stage. So be a designer, we really want to create good and build sustainability thinking into the design process. So Sweet Green, um, this is a project that uh, we have done a few years ago. Um, I hope you guys have chance to uh, go to the restaurant. Uh, it's a um, chain restaurant. Um, I think there, there, there are a few in LA. We also have one in San Francisco. It was founded in August 20, uh, 2007 by three young founders. New, uh, newly graduated from school, Nicholas, Nathaniel Rue, uh, Jonathan, 
Newman. So as of October 2017, when, when we kick off the project, it has 77 stores uh, across the United States. I'm sure now it has many more. And more than a restaurant, um, they have um, fans coast to coast for both the yummy and healthy food from locally sourced um, um, ingredients, but also the lifestyle they bring to the community, such as uh, they have farmer's market. They also have music festivals called Sweet Life. And while they're really building a successful lifestyle, um, successful lifestyle brands, they realize that really there's something blocking them from growing bigger, which was the bowl. So originally they use these off the shelf um, um, salad bowls for the salad, for both the warm and the cold uh, salad. And, you know, they realize these bowls um, in, it's not brandable. Everyone's using it, it's not ownable, but also brings complexity, complexity for salad mixing. It's really hard to mix the bowl yourself if you take it to go. Dressing containers also jam inside the ingredients. And also if you um, order something warm, like for example, uh, some salmon and you know, salmon would um, really affect, you know, the, the heat will really cause other ingredients uh, like, like the green or the bread, uh, the bread to be soggy. And they feel like the next step to grow their business is really to increase 50% of online ordering, which was really true because during the pandemic, <laughs> their business was really just depends on the online ordering. So I'm glad that we solved the problem before this happened. So to knowing that, you know, knowing that the client asked and knowing these issues, we um, went to a few of the restaurants, one in New York, one in DC, the first Sweet Green, um, restaurant and one in LA to, to really do um, this immersive research, look into the line efficiency, uh, portability for both employee and customer and mixability. So after you order. And we realized that, that there are a few issues. So first is there are too many bowls and bowls and lids. So too many SKU, so two different um, to go containers. And there's also um, the one bowl that you use uh, if you are eating in the, in the restaurant. There's also a metal bowl for mix. And then the light line efficiency is very low um, because the process is they need to drop the ingredients into this um, salad bowl and then drop everything into the metal bowl and then they mix from the metal bowl and then pour everything back to the salad bowl. And this metal bowl uh, obviously can only be used once. So after use, you need to wash it. Um, also the metal bowl is big. Um, it took over so much counter space. Uh, we have seen that during the rush hours, like completely slow down the entire line um, by, you know, by using the metal bowl. And one major issue is um, because they need to wash the metal bowl, uh, each time. So washing the metal bowl, you know, take over lots of waste for the water. Also, there's always lots of food waste uh, from the metal bowl as well. So this is, uh, so they have to dip the metal bowl into three buckets of water. So from the research, we know that we're not really just designed for a brand bowl, a better looking bowl. We also really need to elevate the taste to really reduce um, the waste, uh, time and material, increase efficiency. But yes, we do need to make the bowl ownable and iconic. So we work, um, in the beginning, we work on many ways to really increase the size, um, make the bowl expandable so that, you know, when you order is a small bowl, but when you're eating what you want to mix, it can expand, either make it bigger, wider, or taller. So we did these um, mockups, and we also have like internal 
uh, we bought free lunch for everyone. So I had them to try out how to mix a bowl. And quickly we learned that um, the expandable bowl is like, you know, because the salad is too heavy and then just become flat in the entire, <laughs> entire bowl. The experience is not that great. The tall bowl is really hard. It's easy to make, but it's really hard to eat. Um, so there's issues here and there. And then we look into um, how we can replace the metal ball. Um, maybe, you know, one of the ideas is create a cone. And this cone has a hole. So, you, you, you know, you place a cone up on top of the bowl, you mix, and through the hole, you can push the salad over. So we also, create mock-ups by using different kind of paper and make sure the paper you know, is structural enough to, to be able to um, sustain from the entire mixing uh, experience, mixing process. And then we also did this testing in the restaurant with the employees together to see how they can use it. And then we found out, um, yes, you can mix with the cone. But it's still a little difficult to push the salad through the bowl. But most importantly, the paper cone, um, although the paper is compostable material, but still creates a lot of waste. So after a year of concepting, development, you know, mock-up, you know, trying different kind of material, we kind of feel like we need to have one solution to enable both the in-store mixing and also the self-mixing. Um, and then we feel like, you know, we really need to have a simple solution. And, and after trying many ways, we feel like the simplest solution is really to make a wider bowl. But the issue is once you make the bowl bigger and wider, it becomes softer, the material is flimsy. But we don't want to increase the material thickness um, because potentially it's making it harder, make it harder to compose also like lots of waste of the material. So we bring back one of the idea we have earlier um, from the one of the origami bowl for this hexagon form. So we bring the form back and create these corners to strengthen the bowl, right? By using these corners, the, by using the same thickness of the material, the bowl is much more structural. And also the corner will help um, for people to be able to grab, you know, so for, for the staff be able to mix uh, inside the bowl, they can grab the corners when they're mixing. And we continue to refine the form and the size. You know, what's the right size you can you can mix the bowl that doesn't feel too big, uh, doesn't feel intimidating when you're eating salad. Wow, well, such a big bowl of salad. But also um, for the for the extra space, how we can utilize this space. So we have this lid going concave, and on top of the lid, you can put salad dressing, um, you can also put utensils and napkins. So it also makes the bowls stackable for online order. So that's the final bowl. And I hope you guys have tried the salads. It's actually every time I go to eat their salads, super tasty um, and really happy to see the bowl. And it's functioning really well in the store. So we took this video um, to see, you know, the entire process. Yeah, so they're still able to make um, like regular way. Well, this thing is also easy. Yeah, so after they use this new ball, they were able to eliminate the metal ball, um, which um, you know largely reduced the waste of water and food. So that's really, really great outcome. And 
Sweet Green came to us at first really just to redesign the boat, but our design really looked into the entire system, the entire experience. And at the end of it, it's not just the boat, but also minimize the use of material, reduction of waste and energy, and decrease the negative impact and you know, be able to protect the environment and you know, contain the consistency of the tasty, um, tasty food. So I think sweet green is just one example how we um, you know, look into the sustainable, sustainable design um, throughout the entire, entire process. Traditionally, people think sustainable design is really mainly the material, but it's actually a system approach. We really need to consider sustainability through the entire process not just the material, but also supply chain, finance, marketing, product development, servicing. And, you know, this is really a um, cross-disciplinary -discipl approach. And when we look into sustain sustainability into consumer el electronics, it's even much, much harder. So this is um, a photo that I took um, through one of the projects we work with Fortune 100 company. We really help them to establish, um, you know, sustainability and become a foundation of the design and to really not making sustainability a nice to have, to make it must to have and really build that into the process from the beginning. So we work on, the pro uh, we work on multiple projects with them. Hopefully um, we'll see them on the market soon. So in summary, um, obviously, right, good design really brings vision to life, enable technology integrate with our life, elevate human experience, really brings attention to different group and users, and brings efficiency, sustainability to help shape a better world. And talking about responsibility of design, um, and tonight I only spend one hour talking about this, but I hope, um, you know, in the future um, with the passion of design from everyone, um, I hope everyone's able to help build a, the better future, not just for us, um, for the next generation, for your children, and also for our world. So that's all I want to talk about today. Thank you so much for listening.